right, welcome back. Um, in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at chapter 11, um, looking at the, the relatively new era uh, or new time in life of emerging adulthood. Um, so you can find the chapter on page 383. Uh, you can also find the PowerPoint in D2L, which is place you found this video more than likely. And um, so if you'd like to follow along that with that, do that. Um, make sure you do the quizzes. Listen for the four random facts as we go. I'm sure I got my lip. I do. Um, so that way you're, you're, you know, ready for the test, basically. Um, and also make sure you do the other test that has to do with the, re the readings from the book. Uh, so yeah, beyond that, everything should be good. Uh, this week, or not this week, but this, but this section, so adulthood, um, before we get to late adulthood, adulthood itself, we're going to have three chapters. So just be aware of that. The, uh, we have chapter 11, which is emerging adulthood, and then your normal adulthood, which goes uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13. So if you want to read ahead, you can look at the, doing those things um, by doing that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Let's get rolling. <clears throat> so emerging adulthood, this is actually, like I said, an, a newer period, uh, or is considered a newer period. It basically uh, was proposed by a professor named Jeffrey Arnett back in the early 2000s. Um, and he was looking at the, uh, he's kind of looking at basically like the, the shift that we've seen, especially in the Western world, he was specifically looking at America, Canada, and Western Europe uh, initially. And there's this, this kind of interesting stage now that Erickson hadn't recognized, that basically no, no real um, psychologist had really pinpointed until he pointed it out himself. Um, and it's this, it's this kind of extension that we're seeing of adolescence merging with the beginnings of adulthood. Um, that didn't used to be the case. So slide two, body, mind, and social world. Um, emerging adulthood. So it's a period between the ages of 18 and 25, approximately. So once we get, now as, as we're moving into adulthood, basically with adolescence, the, the, the beginning and ends get blurrier, right? Adolescence, it basically begins with puberty, which means it could start as early as eight for some, but it generally doesn't start till closer to 10, 11, 12, right? So there's kind of, there's this wiggle room in there. Um, and then the ending is around 18, give or take. <clears throat> Emerging adulthood is basically the recognition that uh, today, adolescence is kind of being extended further, right? We're not taking on those traditional adult responsibilities of a lifelong career by the age of 20, or getting married in our late teens, early 20s, um, having kids right away and things like that. We're, those things are getting postponed until a little bit later on in life. Um, and because of that, this is where they've begun to look at this idea of this is kind of a, its own separate stage where, where it, it's a continuation of kind of finding ourselves um, while at the same time starting to take on the responsibilities that adults uh, generally or historically would have been taking on. Okay. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting one. Erickson has, has three stages basically in adulthood. You have early adulthood, middle, middle adulthood, and later adulthood. Um, so this kind of is an overlap of Erickson's early adulthood, as well as the adolescence continuing. So away we go. All right, three, opposing perspectives, a welcome stage or just weird, weird standing for Western educated, industrialized, rich Democrats. Um, what they're finding basically is that initially it really was a weird thing. It really was um, kind of, the, it was a luxury stage of life, if you will. Um, which basically was afforded to those that were from Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries. Um, what they've been finding though is that it, 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 is, it is extending more and more worldwide um, as they've been studying it more over the last couple of decades. So um, emerging adulthood, again, according to Arnett in Western cultures, conclusions was based on young adults from many Western European nations. Uh, recent research suggests that emerging adulthood is coming to every nation not just the weird ones. Okay. Um, no emerging adulthood or EA conclusions based on American college students may apply to those who are weird. Okay, basically. So um, college students specifically, and this is actually where, where it's why it seems to be going more worldwide is as 
as higher education becomes more and more of a thing, um, it allows for a uh, socially acceptable postponement of adult responsibility, essentially. Um, and so be, with that being opened up, it, it is extending into this period. And it also really does kind of give you that uh, ability for further exploration of the idea of who am I, right, that we found in, in, um, in adolescence. So it's an interesting thing, right? There still actually is a lot of debate in the academic world on whether or not this should really be like if it's justifiable to call this its own stage or if it, in fact it, it really is just kind of people aren't aren't moving through adolescence like they should or as fast as they used to perhaps might be a better way to look at it um, and so basically adolescence is taking longer than it used to uh, in which case it really wouldn't be a new stage it would just be a a a, a, a elongation of the old stage so up for debate okay um, all right, slide four, body development, part one, strong and active bodies, usually good health, optimal function in every body system, and extra capacity for extra burden. Um, basically, this is the time in your life that you are going to be at your peak potential. Okay, between 18 approximately and 25, you are going to be physically at your peak. Your brain is full is coming into full development, so you're going to be able to, to think at a higher rate than any other point in your life. After 25, it's a slow decline, basically, from that point forward. Um, so body's functioning higher. Your mind is coming into full maturation, so it, it's, it's going to be functioning at a much higher level. You can think much more abstractly and much more quickly than you ever have before. Um, you're, you're actually going to be at your happiest. Basically, the only time that's happier than this is when you were a small child and possibly when you're in your 80s or older. Okay, so nice thing is like we're bookend on both ends with very, very happy stages of life typically. Um, but this is going to be the happiest you're going to be. There's going to be actually a slow decline in happiness. It's actually kind of a U curve. So you have the bell curve, right? This is a U curve. We, we drop down. Um, and we'll look at the, the bottom end. It happens right in middle adulthood. So the idea of like midlife crisis actually is tied into uh, a certain stage of life. And it seems to be biological rather than like a genetic, genetic factor rather than a cultural factor. It is universal around the world. Midlife, somewhere between 45 and 50, with 48 actually being the exact average, is the lowest point for most people's happiness levels. Um, but then it starts going up again. So, right, it's a U. So if you can make it through that, you, you come up on the other side, around Mount, early to mid-60s they've been finding, um, you're back to about as happy as you were when you were around 18, 20. Okay. So anyway, but there, if you are in this stage, 18, 20, give or take, Take advantage of it. Enjoy it. Love it. Um, do everything you can to, 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 to seize the day, basically, with it. Um, but yeah, this is going to be the point when, when again, you have your, your highest level of potential is achievable in this period, right? Uh, so if you want to run fast, if you train at all, your body will basically adapt to that quickly in this stage. If you want to lift heavy, this is the time to do it. If you want to be a bodybuilder, this is the time to do it. There's a reason why most Olympic athletes are between 18 and 25, right? Um, like this, this is that optimum stage. Flexibility is going to be at its potential peak. Um, and that's not to say like if you're a, if you're a 20 year old couch potato and you choose not to do anything. And then when you're in your forties, you, you, you have a change of heart and you're like, you know what, you know, it might be literally a change of heart. It might be like, Oh dear, like if I don't do something, I'm going to die. Uh, in that case, uh, it doesn't mean that you're like screwed, right? Like you, you can, in fact, recover and, and improve yourself. So you might be in better health later in life, technically, but the potential for the highest amount of health is at this stage. So if you're doing the things that you should be doing, um, this is where you can achieve that full potential. Okay. Okay. I, you know, you hear stories about guys like, when I turned 65, I suddenly, you know, I went from a 300 pound chubby guy to, you know, bodybuilder or something. Uh, and it is possible. It's just a lot harder to do it at that stage than if you did it in your early 20s. Okay. Uh, organ reserve. Um, so organ reserve is the extra capacity built into each organ, such as the heart and lungs that allows a person to cope with extraordinary demands and to withstand organ strain. Your entire body, including all your organs, are at their peak at this point. Okay. Uh, this is also why, like if you if you drink too much, I don't recommend doing so, but if you do, uh, when you're like 21, 22, 
your body will actually be able to process that a little bit easier because the organs are basically have this reserve that allows them to get abused a little bit more. Not a smart idea, right? The wear and tear is going to add up, um, but it's not going to hit you as hard, right? Uh, personal example, when I was in my early 20s and in college, I drank more than I probably should have on, on several weekends. Um, in fact, I know I drank more than I should have because I, I, my big party trick was I would go shot for shot with people and I would be last man standing, literally. They would like collapse, and I, which was so dangerous. Don't play that game. That is like the worst game in the world. But given my genetic background, as well as my body type, and all these, and the fact that I'm a male, and all these different factors, I have an exceptionally high uh, alcohol tolerance. Um, not necessarily something to be proud of, but it, I did, right? Um, but I didn't have any. I didn't really ever have any hangovers. Like the next day, I might feel a little bit off, but like otherwise, I was pretty much fine. Um, <clears throat> I'd eat some eggs and, and you know extra salt and drink a Gatorade, and I'd be good. Um, something around 25. I tried it once. I was 26 the last time I got drunk. Um, and I had the worst hanger over for almost a week afterwards. And I was like, nope, not going to do that anymore. My my organ reserve had been depleted or at least had been lowered to the point where, where suddenly I had a much more drastic negative effect from that. Okay. And it wasn't like an every weekend kind of thing, even when I was in college, when I was in that kind of party mode. But I was probably every couple of weekends or once or twice a month at least. Um, not a smart thing. Don't do that. If you can avoid that, I would avoid that. But <clears throat> anyway, um, so yeah, our organs are at a higher level, right? If you're if you're wanting to run, if you're wanting to lift heavy, all those kinds of things, your heart and your lungs and everything are, are, are functioning at a higher level than they will later. Okay. Um, with that, homeostasis is the adjustment of all of the body's systems to keep physiological functions in a state of equilibrium. It's a moment by moment. Okay, so as the body ages, it takes longer for these homeostatic adjustments to occur, so it becomes harder for older bodies to adapt to stress. There's a reason why, and I don't recommend doing this either, there's a reason why, though, you can function with very little sleep, most people, in this stage, um, compared to later. Okay, uh, and essentially that is this, your, your body can adjust. As, you're, as you put strain and stress on your body, your body is basically constantly adjusting its balances within itself. Um, and it happens relatively quickly in this period of life, right? Um, you can actually be, you can see this literally if you have if you have decent vision during this time of life. Um, you bring your hand up real close to you, and you look out in the distance, and it's it, you won't notice any time lapse usually for your eyes to to adjust from right up close to you know mountains off in the distance kind of a thing. Um, me, as I'm getting close to 40 now, when I do this and I look up, I can feel my eyes. It almost feels like if you're looking through binoculars and you do that kind of like you shift them to try to get them into focus. My eyes do that for a second or two as they're making the, the adjustment. My, they don't they don't adjust to the strain that I'm putting on them as quickly. And that's kind of a, you know, just that's just the eyes. All of your body is basically doing that same thing, right? And 20s, we bounce back easier. When I, Once you're in your, after that, basically anywhere after 25, it's a, again, it's a kind of slow decline where, where our bodies just don't bounce back as quickly. The closer you are to 25, the more quickly they will bounce back. And the more you exercise your body, put it through its through its paces, um, the more likely you will continue to bounce back more easily. But it, it is definitely one of those, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Um, so you lose muscle tone, you lose bone structure, all those kinds of things, and organ functioning and everything like that, if you're not taking care of them and you know, putting them kind of through their paces. So uh, that's homeostasis. Allostasis is a dynamic body adjustment related to homeostasis that over time affects overall physiology. Um, let's see, what would be a good example of this one? When I was in, in judo and jujitsu and a couple different, I also did chin na, it's a Chinese kung fu version of grappling. Um, but you get thrown a lot <clears throat> and you hit the ground a lot. Right, like that judo is the whole, the whole point of judo is basically learning how to throw people high and slam them down hard. Um, when that happens over and over and over again, initially your body you know reacts to the impacts and things like that. But with, over time, the allostasis is this, this adjusting and the shifting of in our physiology where your body adapts to the repeated uh, experiences that it goes through. So in this case, most guys when you, or most people, guys or girls. Um, if you get into judo or some kind of a grappling art where you're getting slammed on the ground regularly, uh, you'll gain weight. 
but you don't gain any obvious weight on the outside. But on the scale, all of a sudden you'll be five, eight pounds, 10 pounds heavier than you were before you started. Um, and what they, what they, what it actually is, is your, your bone density gets denser. You, you gain density. Um, basically with repeated abuse like that, your bones are like, okay, I don't want to break. So therefore your, your body sends out all the little bone building things and you get higher levels of calcium buildup in those bones and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And with that density, you get weight. Okay. But it's a long-term thing. It's, it's repeated activity. Your body then adapts to that repeated stressor. Okay. Same thing. Like if you're a long distance runner, if you're a heavy lifter, again, those are, those are two like that. They're go-tos for me. Um, you know, if you're wanting to lift like 400 pounds or more, or if you're, you're wanting to run at least three or four or five miles, um, that's your body will adapt to that repeated stress if you do it regularly. Okay. So it's connected to the homeostasis. The homeostasis is the immediate, your body adjusting to kind of find its equilibrium in the moment. Uh, allostasis is that long-term adjustment, uh, that allows your body to do more and more and more over time. Okay. Um, so it's a longer, a longer, or requires longer term adjustment in this case. Allostatic load is the stresses of basic body systems that can bind to limit overall functioning. So higher allostatic load makes a person more, more vulnerable to illness. Let's say you've gone a couple of weeks where you've gotten maybe three or four hours of sleep a night. Okay. Um, so you're tired, your body hasn't had a chance to really recover. On top of that, you're not eating really well. Um, you're also maybe drinking way too much coffee, maybe, right? Or eating lots of sugary foods and things like that. You haven't been exercising very much. All of those factors, right, are putting additional stress on you. And then on top of that, you're, you're a student. So you're, you're writing papers and reading books and, you know, putting strain on yourself. Um, maybe that's why you're only getting three or four hours of sleep because you're, you're, you're trying to get it all done. And then maybe you're working a job on the side and maybe you got kids, right? And all these kinds of factors. Um, all of those things are the allostatic load. It's, it's the stressors that are, you're getting put onto your body. Um, and it builds up, right? The higher the load, basically the less reserves we have in every area, which makes us more vulnerable to illness, injury, and all those kinds of things. Um, same kind of thing if you're physically training, like if you're, if you're becoming a runner or something like that, if you, if you push yourself too hard, you can end up hurting yourself because you put, it's a too high of an allostatic load um, on your body. Okay, that's why you rest days are important, right? Okay, so yeah, you're at your peak. This is basically the point in the class when it begins to get a little depressing, or it maybe it's it's the signs of the, the slightly like oh bummer side of things that are come to come after this stage, right? This is your peak. If you're 18 to 25, take advantage of it. If you're over at like I am, um, bummer, right? But anyway, hopefully you hopefully you you, you took advantage of it when you had it. Okay, slide five, body development part two. Uh, load and balancing examples. <clears throat> so again, things like adequate deep sleep, proper nutrition, exercise or cardio, or cardio um, breathing well, like it's the same things I always talk about, right? If you, if you have those four things, you're gonna have the optimum life. This is the same thing in this stage. If you're getting enough sleep, if you're feeding yourself well, getting enough water and things like that in you, um, you're exercising, both cardio and, and lifting. I've heard some people say like, oh, you only need this and then your life will be fine. Um, generally speaking, that's not 100% true. It is true that any kind of exercise is better than no exercise, right? So if you only like cardio and that's all you ever do, that is much better than just sitting on the couch. And if you only like lifting, right? You're like into like deadlifts and all that kind of stuff. Um, cool, right? Like that, that you're much better off in the long run. And in some ways, actually, the deadlift, the, the, the heavy lifting is actually better for you long term than the cardio is uh, because there is some element of cardio in it, but it also increases bone density and balance and things like that better than the cardio does. Um, but if that's all that you're doing, um, you're limiting the potential that you have, right? Like flexibility and things like that are, are being limited if that's all you're focusing on is one aspect of it. Anyway, um, there's a little image here. You've got insufficient sleep and kind of some of the issues with this. Um, you can see this also on page 387 if you're following along with the book. But what they found is that with insufficient sleep, you have decreases in energy. Duh, right? You're tired. You have decreases in alertness, also a duh. Decreases in health. Your immune system basically begins to fall the more tired you become, the more sleep deprived you become. Um, and life expectancy overall declines. You, you, they, have, they have 
they basically linked it with they or they have found that if you don't get enough sleep, um, it ends up actually being similar to people who smoke, uh, as far as your your the potential for early death is significantly higher if you don't get adequate sleep on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> you will find if you also have insufficient sleep, you'll have increases in appetite. You eat more. Um, your weight will typically gain. Uh, depression, the high chances of depression increase significantly, and you have a higher level of accidents, which goes along with the decreased level of alertness, right? You, you're going to be doing mistakes and things much more often if you are not getting enough sleep. So sleep, exercise, eat well, drink enough water, take a deep breath, and get that oxygen in your system. Um, all those things are going to help you in this stage, as well as every stage of life. So slide six. And real quick, I'm going to give you the first random fact. Um, Charles Dickens, the famous author, right, made the, the Christmas Carol and all those books, um, would always realign the bed he was sleeping in to face northwards as he felt it helped to unlock creativity. So even when he was traveling, actually, he would, he would move, if the bed wasn't faced northwards, he would turn it because he felt like that would basically help his mind uh, be at its best. There you go. Charles Dickens. Kind of a weird little guy. Uh, wrote some amazing books, though. So if you haven't read Charles Dickens, you need to read some of his works. He's excellent. Anyway, back to the back to the stuff. Slide six. Challenges to health. Um, sex, not marriage is going to be one area. Okay. So the we have the end of the shotgun weddings, typically, culturally, worldwide. Um, shotgun weddings, if you're not aware of this, is when, you know, it's like, hmm, Johnny and Susie are together. Susie seems to be getting a little bit bigger on the waist. Oh, they're getting married next month. Like, right. And then, wow, they must have, their baby is here like two months after they got married. Okay. That, that's a shotgun wedding, right? Um, interestingly, historically, that was actually a fairly common thing. Uh, there was a tendency for, for young men and young women to try each other out to see if they actually were fertile. And if they were, they would get married. And that was part, that was part of the marriage thing was wanting to have kids. Um, getting your, your genes into the next generation and having those, those kids there to help you. Um, so that was a, that was actually, again, historically hundred plus years ago, that was a pretty common thing to see happening today that that happens less and less, right? Um, we don't have the tendency of seeing that marriage, if, if you happen to get pregnant, it's not necessarily that you're going to lead into getting married, um, to some extent, right? Part of that's going to be due to the effect of contraception. Um, also, the, the 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 cultural acceptance of unmarried pregnancy is is, is much more um, prevalent today around the world as well, especially though in America and the West. Um, so yeah, this is this is kind of important though because you got to remember that this is this is the time eighteen to twenty five is actually going to be when you're at your peak fertility. So you're going to be driven a little less driven than you were maybe in early adolescence when you're just blasted with hormones. Um, but you're going to be driven to still try to reproduce, right? So things like contraception and things like that can basically block um, the natural outcome of intercourse. And since this is a time when we're typically putting off those adult responsibilities like getting married and having kids, um, that basically that, that kind of scratches the itch. So you, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't feel very fitting. But anyway, it, it, you know, the, 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 we have these drives. Um, and this allows us to, to participate in things that might be trying to fulfill those drives while not having the like direct consequence, right? Um, I always think it's interesting when people are having sex and they get surprised that they get pregnant. Like that is the normal outcome. That's usually what you're going for if you're having sex. But anyway, uh, that's, that's, that, that, uh, contraceptives and things like that have, have basically kept that from happening as much. Now, they are not 100% guaranteed at all. I have a friend who, him and his wife, um, they were using condoms and birth control, and they had a, they got pregnant. So, um, you know, these are not going to be a 100% a effective kind of a thing, but it does increase the likelihood of, or reduce the likelihood of having a child at that time. Um, new diseases. There's a rise in sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, and it's a global thing. It's not just the United States thing. Um, there is much higher levels of, of, of people contracting STIs um, and a very high level of this happening in early adulthood or this emerging adulthood. Um, HIV and AIDS is still on the rise. And that also is partially due to the fact that a lot of people who get it 
uh, don't educate themselves in, in, in kind of how to do it. They're like, well, we're going to use a condom and it'll be safe. Um, that's not really how it works. There's a lot of times when condoms fail. Um, Africa was actually a, a proof of that. They, they, instead of teaching people how to work with AIDS, they just started handing out condoms, basically to like, you know, here, protect yourself kind of a thing. Um, and it, essentially what they found is when they started doing that, the, there was actually an increase in AIDS and H, HIV virus in at least three of the countries that I know of. Um, and so they started changing gears. And basically the two, the two things they started practicing were um, they started encouraging abstinence, which might not be real popular, but it, it was, it's the best way to deal with it. But then they also started uh, teaching like how to deal with these things. So HIV and AIDS is one of those, it, uh, the first six months after contraction, you're at your most infectious. Um, so basically if you can abstain for at least six months after you've contracted HIV or AIDS, uh, it, it goes from basically a one in, even with a condom, it's like a one in 10 chance of spreading it uh, to a one in 1000 chance of spreading it. So the, it, it reduces the likelihood of, of um, spreading the, the, the infection around, right? Um, so yeah, kind of a, kind of an important shift there. Um, but it's also, this is also time again, sex drive is going to be still be very powerful. And so, uh, and we're, we're still dealing with that kind of Wolverine mentality, right? Where like, it might affect other people, but it's not going to affect me kind of a thing or hurt me. Um, so with that, it, this is kind of a tough one, right? Like we, 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 we might overlook what we should know kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> if you do choose to have kids in this period, um, this actually is the best time for people to begin having children, specifically for women to begin start having children. Um, infertility is going to be at a, at, a, at a low. This is going to be the lowest basically for, for any time of life for infertility. Um, sex drives strong. Chances of orgasm are much more, more likely, especially for women. Again, men are, men basically orgasm is relatively easy for guys. You know, it's like, pow. But anyway, the, uh, for girls, it's, for girls, it's a little bit more challenging the older they get, um, and it and it can be challenging for them even when they're younger. But anyway, um, orgasm is also a part of that fertility. Orgasm basically helps to pull the, the the semen deeper into the canals to basically increase the likelihood of um, increase the likelihood of, of conceiving. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you're also actually the most likely to experience an orgasm as a female uh, during ovulation when you're at your at your peak fertility. Uh, that is when your your body is the most likely to experience that orgasm. Um, interesting other side thing. Uh, I don't know why I'm focusing on this one so much, but anyway, with contraception, you actually reduce the likelihood of of experiencing an orgasm as a female. Um, this is also the point when birth is going to be its easiest. Your body is going to adapt and adjust and and make it. You're going to have the least chances of complications in the birthing process. You have a higher chance of being able to have a natural birth uh, rather than having to have a C-section. Um, and yeah, all that is, is true for, for 18 to 25-ish. Uh, that is kind of the optimum time to begin having children if you want to have them. Um, but they're, 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 that is becoming less and less likely, right? Um, we have fewer marriages by 20 than we ever have. And the tendency is to want sex without getting pregnant in this time. Um, sex trafficking is a, at a very high level during adolescence and early, adult, or, yeah, early adulthood or this emerging adulthood. Um, this is the time when we are, for women specifically, they are the most, um, desirable on a biological level because of the fact that they are at their highest fertility, right? And, um, guys are actually a little less desirable generally at this, for, for the most part, they're a little less attractive, uh, when they do all the polls and things. Um, middle adulthood seems to be the time when guys become the most attractive because that they kind of hit their peak power. Right. It's like when you look at like deer and stuff, right? The big guy, the biggest, the biggest deer isn't that young buck. It's that buck that's three to five years old. Um, he's had some experience and he's, he's proven himself through these years. And that's essentially guys are more attractive the older they get to some extent. Girls are the most attractive when they're at this peak fertility moment. Okay. Not that it's all about attraction, but that I mean when it comes to sex, that's basically is what it is about is, is attraction. Um, seven, <clears throat> taking risks, part one. So risk taking may be an asset or a liability. This basically has not gone away yet, right? 
We are still risk takers until 24, 25, 26, somewhere right in there, um, when, when the prefrontal cortex really does fully uh, mature and come online. Um, what's interesting is you, you'll, you might notice if you're entering into that stage of like mid-20s, um, you might notice that things that you enjoyed before that were kind of risky might be less enjoyable. There might be the fear factor might come in more and more as you move uh, deeper into adulthood. Um, and that essentially is that you, you, you can actually be experiencing your, your prefrontal cortex coming deeper and deeper online. Um, emerging adults have more serious accidents than do people of any other age. So even compared to adolescents, uh, this is the time when people are more likely to do to, to stupid things, basically. Uh, basically, you have enough experience to be dangerous and while at the same time um, still having that lack of fear. So your choices might not always be the best. Uh, maturation, not experience, affects risk assessment. Doesn't matter how much experience you have. Uh, it really does matter what your, where your brain is and how it's maturing. Um, so yeah, this is why we are much more likely to, to do stupid things like drive way too fast, um, jump off of things we probably shouldn't have jumped off of, uh, you know, choose to, to participate in sports and activities that are, um, that have a higher risk of injury and things like that in this period. There's a reason why Marines are typically 18 years old and not like 30, right? Uh, you find a 30 year old Marine every now and then, but usually they're going to be those 18 year old pups that, that still have that sense of like invulnerability, um, in them. Okay. Slide eight, send them home. Adults with accidental injury treated in U S hospitals in 2013. Males are more likely, much more likely to, to experience, uh, injury in this stage until Basically, when there's a flip-flop is finally is, is when you uh, get to your 60s-ish. Um, at that point, the, the, the likelihood it goes up for, for women and goes down, continues to go down for men um, in that period. And that usually is connected to actually falls and uh, how brittle bones are at that point. But at this stage of life, um, typically, you know, you'll, they'll, they'll, if you hurt yourself, assuming you didn't kill yourself, they'll patch you up. Uh, and, but you heal, you still heal relatively quickly, not as quickly as you did as a kid, but quicker than you will at a later points in adulthood. Um, so the likelihood is that you'll just, they'll patch you up and send you home. Um, you're at a very low chance of disease in this point. So typically hospital visits at this, at, in this stage of life are, are due to poor choices rather than, or potentially just accidents, um, rather than disease and those kinds of things. So. Okay, <clears throat> let's see, slide nine. Oh, and that, that also, that image we were looking at, you can find that same image on, I believe, check, where are you? Page 392 from that, from slide eight. Um, so yeah, so again, if you're following along with the book, there you go. Um, slide nine, drug abuse, taking risks, part two. Um, ingestion of a drug to the extent that if it impairs the user's biological or psychological well-being. Um, early adulthood, late adolescence and early end of this emerging adulthood is basically going to be the peak time of the likelihood of somebody choosing to abuse drugs. Okay, Whether that be something that's totally accepted like caffeine um, or nicotine, or like nicotine is not as accepted as it used to be, but things like that or alcohol or hard drugs like meth and cocaine and um, you know all the opium based things and things like that um, any of those you're, you're also going to be the most likely to, to use things like psychedelics uh, magic shrooms and, and, and LSD and all those kinds of things um, so yeah generally it, it, it peaks around 21 to 22 for most people and then it begins to deep drop off uh generally around 25 to 28 um you'll, you'll see a, a decline in use of an abuse of um, various drugs and substances um if you look in our book uh well actually i have to go back it's coming up so we'll, we'll I'll hang on there okay 10 taking risks part three uh, low rate of disease between age, ages 18 and 25, it's counterbalanced by a high rate of violent death. So driving without, we're, you're more likely to be driving without a seatbelt, uh, more likely to carry a loaded gun, you're more likely to abuse drugs, you're more likely to do have addictive gambling habits in this time. Again, we have that, that tendency to think that nothing's going to touch us still. 
Um, and so we, we might choose to do more risky behaviors, right? This was the time when I was like double black diamond snowboarding and backcountry skiing. I started a few avalanches in my life. One of them actually had a ride out. That was terrifying. It was like up to here. I mean, I'm a tall guy, right? And I could not get out. I was in a chute and the snow let go. And I somehow stayed up and I somehow shot out the bottom. It was terrifying. But um, I rode I rode steers and bulls a little bit in this time and bucking horses. Um, I was a rock climber, right? I, looking back, I'm like, I'm, I don't know how I survived. But um, those kinds of choices are, are, are connected here. There's a good thing that I probably, did. I, I got a motorcycle toward the end of this period, but I was, I was thinking a little smarter than I was before that, right? Um, it's fun. Once I started looking at getting married, I don't have motorcycles anymore. But fatal accidents, homicide, and suicide result in more deaths than all other causes combined. Um, <clears throat> so you actually have an increase, there's a, there's a higher chance of suicide in this time of life than there was in adolescence. Um, which is interesting because this is also for most people the happiest that they're going to experience. Assuming life is going okay, um, they're going to they're they're generally going to be like kind of bright eyed and bushy tailed. But this it's the beginning of where you kind of hit that peak. So little kids super happy, adolescence you have a drop, and then it climbs back up. Okay, um, till about eighteen to twenty, and then you kind of hit a plateau, and then after twenty four twenty five it, it starts to drop. And you, this is where we get that U shape um, in our happiness, right? It kind of, it, it fades out. Now in cultures, what's interesting is this, again, this is worldwide. Um, in cultures where death happens early, you, you still find the drop. But if you, if you die in your 40s, basically you die when you're at the bottom. So it looks more like a ski jump rather than a U curve. Um, but in any culture where you live longer, up into your 60s, you'll see this U. Um, but yeah, basically at this point in life, Disease isn't typically the thing to get you. It can be, right? It's no guarantee that you're not going to die of disease. Um, but you're at the, the lowest point in risk for that. It's those choices that we make that usually get us in this stage. Okay. Um, 11, taking risks, part four. Many colleges restrict alcohol on campus. Drug abuse more frequent more co uh, among college students than those not in college. So this is kind of an interesting one. A lot of people, you probably would think that like with education and stuff, it reduces the likelihood of it. What they found is that uh, young adults or this emerging adulthood, those who go to college are much more likely to get exposed to, to drinking and to drug abuse than, than people who don't. So if you just go right into a career or something like that, um, you're much less likely to abuse these substances compared to those that go to college. Um, things like binge drinking are going to be a, a big part of that, right? College parties, that was basically where I got introduced to the idea of binge drinking. Um, and yeah, everyone liked me. Party Sam. I had different personas I discovered. Um, party Sam was that everyone wanted him at the parties because he was a lot of fun once he gets a few beers in him. Um, <laughs> anyway, choices, right? Um, illegal drug use peaks at about age 20 and sharply decreases with age. Um, again, as our brain turns on more and more, we start to, we start to fade out of those kinds of things. Most who continue after age 25 want to quit. You're going to find very few people who are using like meth and they're older than 25 being like, I love this drug, right? There, it's generally going to be a, a, an addiction issue rather than a desire issue, right? When, when it moves from, I really like this thing to, I have to have this thing. That's, that shows that you've, you've really entered into the realm of addiction. Okay. Slide 12, and you can see this image on page 393, again, if you're following along with the book. Um, too old for that. And it shows that the, the tendencies of things like alcohol binge drinking, where you drink five or more drinks in one occasion. Yeah, don't, don't do that, right? It, it, it would, yeah, it's just not smart. Um, cigarette smokers. Interestingly, cigarette smokers are, are more likely to remain smokers um, until they get into middle age, um, at which point typically, well, the, the problem with smoking, this is, this is the challenging thing with, with cigarettes and chewing tobacco and all those things. Um, not as much with like cigars and pipes. Interestingly, cigars and pipes seem to be significantly less addictive compared to chew and cigarettes. Um, but, but the part of that's probably because of all the chemicals they also add to the substance of chew and, and, and cigarettes. But, um, <clears throat> People who smoke 
you, you basically have no, initially, there's no real negative to it, right? Um, we might be, you know, abstractly aware of the fact that you are increasing the likelihood of cancer or things like that later in life, but it's not affecting you now, right? Um, the only thing you might notice, like a shortness of breath or things like that for cigarette smokers who are inhaling, uh, you might, you know, like, so you might be kind of aware of that there is some things you're not performing as well as you were or things like that. Um, but other than that, there's really the, 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 the benefits of it, the, the, the feelings of calm that it brings and the stimulation to the mind where it, caught, it, it can stimulate creativity and all these things um, feel like they w significantly outweigh the negative effects. Typically, some though, somewhere around middle age, though, right, around 40, give or take, um, you begin to have stronger negative effects from the cigarettes uh, than you did before, which is why we then begin to see this decline in, in smoking. Um, but illegal drug use, and again, this is for people who use illegal drugs at least once in the past month, um, around to age 20 is where you're going to hit that peak, and it's going to kind of fade out from there. Okay. Um, by by your mid 60s, you you see very little uh, abuse of alcohol and drugs. Probably also partially due to the fact that if you did choose to continue using those, you might not have lived to be that old. But um, yeah, so any substance, if you're choosing to use a substance, even that caffeine to alcohol to whatever, uh, moderation is the trick, right? Don't don't over abuse it. And there are some drugs that is basically it's impossible to moderate. Um, so don't use them, right? Meth, you really can't moderate that. Don't use it. It's not a good choice. <clears throat> Marijuana, lots of debate on that one. But if you're going to use it, use it in moderation. Don't be smoking it every day. Um, unless it's for like specific medical reasons or something like that. Make that a special occasion thing. Same with tobacco. If you want to smoke tobacco like a cigar or a pipe, I am. I enjoy a good cigar or a pipe every now and then, but don't do it all the time, right? Spread it out. That way it reduces the likelihood of it damaging you. It can actually be beneficial in some cases. They found that pipe smokers and cigar smokers on average live longer than people who don't smoke tobacco at all. Um, as long as you don't abuse it, don't just smoke the heck out of it every single day. If you're like, you know, Freud, who smoked like 12 cigars a day, that's going to cause problems. You ended up getting jaw cancer and that's why they ended up getting them in the end. Don't do that. Don't, that's, that's not smart. Um, yeah. And if you don't want to use it, don't use it at all. I highly, I don't recommend it necessarily. Um, but yeah, there's some interesting studies that have come out even by the FDA lately about um, the use of natural tobaccos in like hand rolled cigars and pipes and things like that. But anyway, there you go. You might see my pipes back there. So um, 13, cognitive development. So I'm happy. Take that with, I might be biased. I enjoy a pipe every now and then, so that I might be biased. It's like a once a week or, or less kind of thing. So, um, 13, cognitive development, post-formal thought. Um, so Piaget basically ended with, right, like the, the post-formal thought in, in, in adolescence. Like that's, we've, we've hit that point and then basically it just continues to develop from there. Um, but it's basically the same tools, just better honed, according to Piaget. Um, there is a new uh, proposed adult stage of cognitive development following Piaget's four stages. And this is the idea that, in fact, adults do think differently than adolescents do, and that early in, compared to early uh, adults even. So it goes beyond adolescent thinking uh, by being more practical, more flexible, and more dialectical, and less impulsive and reactive. Um, we become much more rational in our thinking uh, the older we get, to some extent. So our, as, our, as our brain, again, continues to develop and really matures, um, we can utilize that thinking and planning. And so, so and generally, if plans don't go exactly as they should, we're going to have an easier time kind of rolling with the punches um, in this stage compared to when we were younger. So a lot of people think that, like, you know, when you're younger, because you, you can kind of just roll with what life gives you, um, it's actually more challenging when you're younger. Because you don't have as much experience, because your your brain isn't as mature, and so therefore, when things don't go the way they should, you don't have as many tools to basically kind of counter that that bounce, um, to counter that that shift in things. Um, we begin to see this this 
starting to swing to this flexibility and this practical side of thinking uh, begins to occur in this emerging adulthood stage, right? The prefrontal cortex is almost there. And with that, uh, it, we're, it's allowing us to basically think and handle things as it comes more easily. Um, 14, cognitive development part one, post-formal thinkers. So uh, use formal analysis to learn science, distill principles, develop arguments, resolve the world's problems. Um, are less impulsive than adolescents, right? We don't just kind of, well, to some extent, depending on who you are, uh, you might not just kind of go with it like as it comes kind of thing, but we, we, we have a tendency to kind of hold and we have that, that, that grit to hold on to things that we really want and be willing to put the work in even more than we were before to achieve the goals that we see as important. Uh, we do not wait for someone to present a problem to solve or for, for circumstances to require a reaction. Um, adolescents do, right? Adolescents, they might see the problem, but they wait for permission or they wait for basically the guidance in stepping in. Early adulthood, you, you, you start to step in when you see that there's a problem to be done, typically. Again, that's gonna change from, or vary from person to person to some extent. Um, but in most cases, the, an individual will, if you see a, there's an issue that needs to be handled and you have the ability to do so, you are likely to do so in this stage. Okay. It's also why this is a stage when you're gonna see, like if, if you ever see rallies, right? Like there's all these political rallies and stuff. There's even actually all this rioting and stuff that happened the last few years. Um, you're very rarely going to see like a 50 year old in there doing that, right? Um, it's majority of them are going to be these late teens, early twenties with this emerging adulthood stage. This is a time in life when we still have some, um, feeling that we really can change the world. Um, that shifts with time. Um, I don't want to think that we actually become more cynical, but we begin to realize typically, and there's, this is a shift in the thinking also, um, as we move out of this emerging adulthood, we start to recognize that the thing that we really have control of is ourselves. And so the, the focus goes from changing the world to changing me. And by doing that, I in fact impact the world. Um, but yeah, the ideology basically of like, you know, go out and we're gonna fix everything. It's awesome. It really, and it really does make a lot of things get done that wouldn't have got done otherwise, right? Sometimes sometimes as a, as a full-fledged adult, we have the tendency of only looking at ourselves because we just kind of maybe have gotten frustrated because the world doesn't change when we try to. Like you push and it, it's like pushing a mountain, right? It just doesn't move. Um, but sometimes you can push a stone, right? You can move a stone that's on the mountain and it, you in fact then moved the mountain a little bit. Um, but sometimes we lose track of that as adults, so. Okay. Uh, let's see, 15, neurological advances in emerging adulthood. So if you look inside the brain on page 395, you'll see this image. Um, gives you a lot more depth on this, but I'm just going to kind of touch base on this. This was a study that they did at, oh, let me see if I have it in my notes, Dartmouth. Um, and then what they did is they basically did brain scans of people who were just entering the college. So these are, majority of them are going to be 18 year olds. Um, fresh out of high school, this is their first semester, and they did a brain scan, and, and then at the end of the first year, they did another brain scan to see what parts of the brain, if any, had changed. Um, so image A is entering residential college means experiencing new foods, new friends, and new neurons. It's, you can find this in the book also, on, again, on page 395. Uh, a longitudinal study of 18-year-old students at the beginning and the end of their first year in college, or at Dartmouth, found increases in the brain areas that integrate emotion and cognition. So if you look at image A, you can see like the blue and green and the kind of orangey and yellow colors in there. Um, those are the parts of the brain that actually continue to develop. They, they, they grew with these new experiences of being away from home for the first time, um, you know, meeting new people and kind of finding your place in this new environment. Um, those are the parts of the brain that actually increased in size. So you have the, the cingulate areas, which is the blue and yellow areas in there. Um, the Kadati, Kadat, Kadate, Kudu, but anyway, uh, in red, read it, you can find it again in the book, and then the insula in the orange sections there. Um, so researchers also studied one-year changes in the brains of students over the age of 25, and they basically found that there was no change, right? The brain had lost its plasticity at that point, basically, um, and there wasn't really any dramatic shift 
We, our brain remains plastic for the entire life, right? It is constantly changing and adapting to things. Um, but by 25, it, 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 it is much less flexible physically than it was when we were younger. Okay. So image B shown here are the areas of one person's brain changes from age 14 to 25. Those are all the areas that you see significant uh, growth in. The purple has demonstrated many changes in uh, the frontal cortex, which is all that purple stuff in that image B. Um, demonstrated many changes in particular parts, as did the areas for processing speech, the green and blue areas of the brain, a crucial aspect of young adult learning. Okay. Um, visual processing in yellow, there was some changes, obviously a little bit of growth, but not a whole lot comparatively. Um, so yeah, kind of interesting stuff. I would recommend reading that on page 395, that, that neurological advancing advances in emerging adulthood. It's an interesting little piece, relatively short. Um, take a look at it. Okay. And again, if you're in this stage of life, right, if you're in this 18 to 25 year old stage, um, take advantage of it. Your brain is still flexible. Give yourself new experiences. Get out there and, and meet new people and do new things that you wouldn't have done before. Um, allow that, allow you to basically give yourself that, that, that time to grow literally in your thinking and in your, in your processing. Um, if you're above it, still get out there and do new experiences. It's good stuff no matter what and anytime you do it, but it does so much more for you if you are in that early stage. Um, 16, cognitive development part two. Uh, countering stereotypes. So cognitive flexibility counters stereotypes as rational thinking aids in recognition and reconciliation of contradictions. This is again, uh, to a large extent, where, where um, experience is gonna be a big factor here. right? Um, you're much, for example, stereotypes of like, let's say like race, right? Or ethnicity. Um, if you've never experienced somebody from a, a given culture or a given ethnicity, uh, it is much easier to have a, a, um, it's much easier to have a racial, a negative racial impression of them, given what you might have learned from second hand or third hand. Uh, communications, right? What you've heard about them paints the picture, but you have no experiences to basically counter that, what you've heard about them with. So if you're in a community where it's very negative, but you've never had any experiences with them, you're much more likely to see them in a very negative light. Okay. So the width of a gap between explicit and implicit discrimination influences the strength of the stereotypes. You can see some more information on this on page 397. There's a view from science stereotype threat. Um, it's really worth taking a look at uh, to kind of understand what's going on here a little bit more. Okay, slide 17, cognitive development part three, stereotype threat. Um, so the stereotype threat is the fear that someone else will judge one's appearance or behavior negatively and thereby confirm that person's prejudiced attitudes. Uh, mere possibility of being negatively stereotyped arouses anxiety that can disrupt cognition and distort emotional regulation. So if you think that you are being judged because of a certain stereotype that you have, it will affect how you perform, which makes sense, right? Um, if I feel like I'm being judged for some aspect that, of who I am, right? Uh, I am much, I'm gonna be basically be experiencing stress, which will in turn affect how I perform. So if I come from a background where I, I think that people think I'm dumb because of a certain thing. For example, this is a personal example. When I grew up, I grew up in, in a rural area, right, in Colorado. Um, I worked on a ranch. I was around a whole bunch of old cowboys, um, very well-read old cowboys, but they were old cowboys, and they all talk with a very Western twang, okay? Uh, I'd say it's somewhere between a Texas drawl and a, like a Kentucky, you know, that kind of smooth southern, southern roll. Um, and I picked it up, right? You could probably still hear it a little bit in my voice when I talk now. Uh, when I was younger, it was much more pronounced. And when I first went to college, I had a lot of people who judged me as kind of like a country bumpkin because I, I talked, well, what, let's see if I can even pull it in again. So I used to kind of talk like this, right? So we're gonna be talking about science today. We're gonna be looking at stereotype threats and all these kinds of things, right? My mind was thinking the same pace that it does now for the most part, right? I was 18, so it's not as good as it was now, but still. Um, but my, my, my speech gave a stereotype for people to judge, and so people assumed that I wasn't gonna perform very well. Um, 
which made it hard, right? What's interesting, I learned to actually change how I spoke because of that, that fact, right? I, I learned to kind of re, at least tone down that, that drawl to some extent um, to, to make it a little bit clearer. Uh, to, I sped up my speech. Again, I, I discovered that people think you're more intelligent if you talk fast. So if you can talk like this, then it, make, it must be really super intelligent because your brain is obviously moving faster, right? Um, don't really do that. Like that's that's pain in the neck. But uh, and to some extent, it's true. When you talk fast, it actually is connected to IQ. Uh, but it's also connected to culture, right? There's a stereotype. The idea of like the slow southerner um, is, is connected to the way that they've learned to speak. The fact that life does move a little bit slower in the South compared to like northern uh, parts of America, and uh, the temperature also makes you want to move a little slower. But the the those are those are all stereotypes that might may or may not be true. Okay, so stereotype threat makes people of all ages doubt their ability, which reduces learning if their anxiety interferes with cognition, and that's the key there, right? Um, if you if you feel like if you if you basically adopt the stereotypes and embrace it. It can, it can hinder you in your development, essentially. Okay. Uh, 18, the effects of college, part one. Cognitive growth and higher education. Um, so is college necessary for a good development? No, not at all. You, can, you could be perfectly fine and never go to college. Um, but there are some things that, that college will, will generally cause to happen that can be very beneficial in our development in this early stage of adulthood. Uh, most contemporary students attend college primarily to secure their vocational and financial future. Um, so this has actually been a big shift. This is part of the reason why there's so many people going to college today compared to in the past. Um, college used to be people would go to college to kind of like discover themselves. And so this, you have like the arts and humanities and those kinds of things were oftentimes much more highly attended compared to the sciences and things like that. So your philosophy, your history, um, all those kinds of fields are going to be, there's going to be a lot of people, even literature and things like that, a lot of people pursuing those. Um, and it wasn't necessarily to get a job afterwards. It was because they wanted to enrich themselves and in their, in their thinking and their knowledge. Okay. Um, it's really been only in the last 30, 40 years that we see that people are going to college specifically to gain the skills needed to get a better job specifically, which is why, again, percentages have changed a lot. Um, college also correlates with better health. College graduates everywhere smoke less, eat better, exercise more, and live longer. Um, probably due to the fact that we get educated in this in, in those kinds of areas, right? We, we, we begin to learn um, the practices and things of, of basically a better life. Not a guarantee, right? I know plenty of professors who smoke cigarettes every day. Um, so definitely not a guarantee, but it is more likely, okay? Um, Tertiary education improves verbal and quantitative abilities, knowledge, and tertiary being the, so it's like secondary, tertiary, the college education, improves verbal and quantitative abilities, um, knowledge of specific subject areas, skills in various professions, reasoning, and reflection. Basically, this is, college is like a gym for the brain. So it's going to be extending your ability to think critically. Um, you're gonna extend your ability to express your thoughts. And these are some of the areas that college can really benefit us in our development in this stage of life. Uh, 19, the effects of college part two, massification. The idea that establishing higher learning institutions and encouraging college enrollment could benefit everyone, the masses, that's massification, has led to a marked increase in the number of emerging adults in college. So again, for example, the United States with, uh, was the first major nation to endorse massification with state-funded universities in all 50 states, often more than one per state. I think Colorado actually has like eight, I think, if you don't include community colleges. If you include community colleges, we go up to like 20-something. Um, and, and then we have a handful of, of private colleges and universities also. Um, I think those numbers are right. That's last I heard, at least. Um, so yeah, right. And, and there was this push, boom, seventies, eighties. Um, there was a strong push for more and more people to go to college, um, rather than just the elites, uh, who were kind of looking for this, you know, deeper, deeper thinking kind of things. Okay. Um, 20. So the education can be very positive. The effects of college part three, debts and dropouts. 
Um, the effects of the education itself can be very good, as well as the experiences that it leads to and things like that. Um, it, it, you know, it, it broadens your experience with people, um, reducing tendencies towards prejudice and all these different things. Um, but most adults believe college is too expensive, which I would actually argue is true. <coughs> uh, I mean, honestly, it, it, on one side, it, it's important, right? So, so it, it is worth some cost. But at the same time, because you know, otherwise professors like that wouldn't get paid enough, which they actually don't. Professors get paid very little. Um, if you're looking at going into a, a good career that pays well, education probably isn't the field you want to go into. I basically have chosen two fields that have like terrible pay. I'm a farmer and a, and a teacher. And I, yeah. Anyway. Um, so yeah, 94% of parents expect college bound children, right? So the majority of people are expecting their kids to go off to college. 75% of all adults believe college is costly, which it is, right? Even if you're going to the state funded colleges, um, CSU Fort Collins, last I heard, was a little over $20,000 a year just for the classes. That doesn't include living costs and things like that. Um, if you go to private colleges, you're looking at forty dollars to $50,000, $60,000 a year um, pretty easily. It's so like DU up in Denver or CC, um, Colorado College in Colorado Springs. If you're looking at like Ivy League or like like Harvard and those, like you're 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 looking at paying about fifty plus thousand dollars a year for those kinds of colleges. Um, do they offer a good education? You bet. Is it worth that? Depends on what you're going to do afterwards, right? Um, college pays off over time for most graduates. Overall, graduates is the specific the thing to pay attention there. Overall statistics are discouraging though. Um, the the there is a very high attendance rate in colleges. Um, with a very high dropout rate in the freshman year. If you drop out of college, okay, um, and you don't get a degree in any way, shape, or form, it may have improved you in your thinking, which is excellent, but essentially, without that little dumb piece of paper at the end of the degree saying that, yes, you have completed this thing and you are an expert and to some extent in this given field, um, it doesn't make you any more valuable right? It might make you a nicer person or a better person, but it doesn't make you any more valuable in the job market specifically. So now you are just in debt with no benefit. Okay. Um, lowest graduation rate colleges are, are typically the most popular. So uh, like Harvard and these colleges, a lot of these colleges that are really hard, I'm trying to think if Harvard's actually one of them. Anyway, a lot of colleges that are very hard, they, everyone wants to go to them, right? They're very popular. But they also have a large number of dropouts. PCC, community colleges in general, uh, are extremely popular nationwide. But they also have some of the highest dropout rates. People begin the classes and then life happens and they fall out of it. Or, or they're, you know, they go and they're like, oh man, this is, this is harder than I thought it was going to be. And they drop out. So they, they don't get the, the real benefits um, as far as financially that they would have if they would have stuck with it. Now, the nice thing with community colleges is typically they're cheap, right? So you're probably not that deep in debt. Um, depending on what you're doing. If you're paying, living on student loans or something, then it might be, get expensive pretty quick. Um, student loan payback can be daunting. What, so a few years back, the average the average debt in the United States of student loans for college students was $35,000. I think that's gone up, um, which is, and that's a lot, right? Uh, I, I have a friend who she, she went to a private college. Uh, she was initially gonna go for law, Halfway through, she changed her mind, didn't want to be a lawyer. She became a teacher. Um, she was $120,000 in debt to become a teacher because okay, she went to this fancy private college to get her law degree, her pre-law. Um, and she's making a teacher salary, right? Um, now, nice thing is that the, the government has offered some things to help with paying back some of those debts. But some of those, some of her loans aren't government loans. Some of her loans are private loans for, you know, private school loans. Um, but those ones don't get erased at some point. And typically they, they don't really get erased that year. went. so if, if you look at loans, this is a little side note, boop. if you're looking at loans and things in college, avoid them. If you can, if you can't, um, take minimal amounts of them, because even if you, you pay the minimum on it, let's say, right. So you don't actually end up paying them off by the end. Uh, the government does say that after a certain number of years, it gets forgiven when it gets forgiven that year, whatever you owe is forgiven, it, you no longer have to pay it back officially, but that forgiveness gets counted as income for that year, meaning you get taxed on it. So if you have $50,000 in debt and the time goes through, 
and you have $50,000 in debt, and let's say you're making like $40,000 a year, that year that it gets forgiven, you suddenly made $90,000 that year according to your taxes. So you have to pay off the taxes on them. Um, so it's a big one, right? It's a big issue. And there's a lot, of, a lot of people who just, they can't afford to pay back their student loans. As much as possible, avoid student loans. Look for, look for scholarships. You don't have to pay scholarships back. They're free. Um, they just give you free money, basically. Look for things like the Pell Grants, grants you don't have to pay back unless you drop out. That in some cases, you have to pay them back. But generally, um, that money goes to, goes to you and your education without any payback. Loans you do. So just be aware of that. But avoid loans if you can. Okay. Advisor Sam just kicked in there. Anyway, 21, college and cognition. Does college advance critical thinking and post-formal thought? Um, the answer is maybe. Okay, so Perry, there's nine levels of complexity in college student thinking. College experience caused progression in most of these. Um, Aram and Ruska found that students' growth in critical thinking analysis and communication over the four years of college was only half as much as among college students two decades ago. There's a, they're, they're looking at why. And one of the reasons they think is the case is that why are they going to college? So 20 years ago, again, just 20 years ago, right? Probably now it'd be like 25 years ago, but let's say like the 90s and, and before that. A large percentage of people were going to college to really just improve themselves. They weren't really looking for, for specific skills. With that, the, the kinds of things they're going for is like philosophy and history and literature and all these different, uh, you know, arts and humanities types of courses, um, which in fact improved our thinking. Um, you know, they, they give you tools that basically sharpen your thinking. If you're going for things like business and things like that, it, they're great programs. Um, and they will improve your thinking in that field, which will generally improve your thinking overall. Thus, there has been was an increase in the last while, um, but it's not as specifically aimed at changing the the efficiency of your thinking per se. It's giving you skills that are more useful in the given field. Um, and so, with that, we might be seeing this decline to some extent in the the overall effectiveness of the improvement in our thinking. So if you are going for business or something like that, I would recommend taking some classes on the side, like philosophy or literature and things like that to kind of improve your overall um, perceptions of the world. So newer pedagogical techniques. There are today we have things like flipped classes where it's run by the students, massive online courses, online courses or MOOCs is what they're known as. Um, you can find those for free oftentimes or for very low cost. So if you just want to get the information, it's a great, it's a great resource out there. Um, success related to student motivation. Right, it used to just be like this is what you got to do, and pfft, there you go. Um, now it's it, it's much more changed. To some extent, it has surely shifted the gears, um, where where the classes even to some extent are going to be better or less depending upon how motivated the students are. I try not to do that as much as possible, but anyway, but that still is kind of a, a normal thing for today. Um, so yeah, the motives behind why we go to college have, are are mixed today compared to what they were in, in previous uh, generations, which kind of undercuts that learning. Okay. Um, 22, the effects of diversity. So ethnic, economic, religious, and cultural diversity. This is one of the coolest parts about college, right? Discussion among people of different backgrounds, ages, and experiences leads to intellectual challenge and deeper thought. I had friends in college um, from pretty much every background you can imagine. So I, here I am like this country kid, right? You know, from the middle of nowhere. Um, and I had friends that were, grew up in inner city New York that were in gang life until they were in adolescence. Um, I had friends that were in Vietnam. I had one friend from Vietnam who he, him and his mom escaped from Vietnam on a raft when he was 13 years old. Um, I had friends from India. I had friends from Japan. I had friends from uh, South Korea. I had friends from Nigeria. I had friends from the, the, the um, Ivory Coast. I had friends from... Uh, some other places. I had friends from Italy. Um, I had one friend from Germany, right? And these are all people that I actually spent time with on a regular basis. We were in clubs together and different things. And so uh, I had this opportunity to basically have this real diverse background. I also got to eat a lot of amazing food because they all cook their food from their countries, which is amazing. Uh, it, it's so much better than you get at restaurants and things. But anyway, uh, that those experiences, right? All of these different people that kind of you, you get pulled together with, um, it, it, it really does change how you see the world. 
like the, my friends from a lot of them from Asia were, were Buddhist. Uh, the guys from India, one of them was Hindu, the other one was Catholic. Um, guys from Africa, I had a, one of them was Muslim, a couple of them were Catholic. Catholics and Muslims seem to be the, kind of the big primary groups in, in Africa, it seems to be, just from, from things I've looked at. But uh, Italy, like the, she, the, the, the girl was basically just kind of a non religious person, right? Germany, uh, he considered himself religious, but I honestly don't know what it was. Um, but when I ask him, like, you know, what do you think about religion? He'd be like, I think it's a very important part of life kind of a thing. And But that, that was as far as it went. Um, so you have that. And you also have the diversity of your 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 instructors, your professors, um, all these different backgrounds of, of where they had been, where they've studied, all this life experience. And all of this is basically given to you in this college experience, hopefully, right, if you go to a decent college. So. Um, those who are most likely to be post-formal thinkers are also those with the most friends from other backgrounds. The, 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 basically, to increase your thinking, if you have diverse uh, experiences and diverse people around you, you, you are improving your overall thinking processing um, at a much higher rate, basically. So make friends. Make friends with people that look weird to you and, and, and seem odd compared to what you're used to. That's awesome. I had a friend, I had a friend who claimed to be pagan. I say claim to be because he also claimed to be atheist, which made no sense to me. I'm like, what? He's like, so he goes off and like dances in the forest because he liked the idea of like doing that. But at the same time, he's like, I don't know. I think there's really such a thing as a God. But at the same time, all the gods are controlling everything. It was confusing. But that kind of diversity, right, changes, changes kind of gives you experiences in, in kind of seeing through someone else's eyes to some extent. Okay, 23. Diversity as thought provoking. Um, diversity of any kind can advance cognition in many areas. And so even if you don't go to college, like you are in college, obviously, you're in this class, right? Um, but even if you choose to drop out and or, and or change paths, um, do your best to seek out opportunities to get connected with people who are from diverse backgrounds. Okay, um, It can really be beneficial. Diversity has increased in colleges across the United States, which is amazing. Uh, again, more experiences for each person basically makes it that much better overall. Uh, emerging adults expand their minds when they have honest conversations with people of different backgrounds, right? L exploring and looking at things. And this also opens up the, the, the potential of you questioning your own ideas and kind of why it is that you do the things that you do. Um, you might end up still going back and finding that you really like the things that you do, right? There's a good reason for it. But you should always go back and look at it. Like, is there a real reason for doing this? Like, is or am I just being a dork, you know, kind of a thing. Um, individuals become more accepting of differences when they realize that they know different people personally. We begin to realize that difference does not necessarily mean worse. And that's important, right? Little kids, if, if something's different, it's, it, it must be inferior to the thing that they have. Um, we realize that that's not necessarily the case. It may be. Like, there is a chance that just because something is different, it actually, in fact, is not as good as something else. Um, but in some cases, it's just different. Right, not better, not worse. And in some cases, it might be different and actually be better than what you've had, and therefore, it gives you the opportunity to expand yourself. All right, 24, becoming your own person, part one. Identity achievement. Remember, we talked about this in adolescence. A lot of people aren't actually achieving identity until later in life, in this emerging adulthood period. So the search for identity still begins at puberty, but it continues much longer than it used to. Um, most emerging adults are still seeking to determine who they are. So Erickson believed that at each stage, the outcome of earlier crises provided the foundation for each new era. So this has kind of actually made this stage a little bit more complicated because essentially we can't move into the, the next stage, which is finding a romantic partner um, or something, someone or something to give ourselves to. We can't truly do that until we know who it is that we are, at least have a decent idea of who we are. Um, and so essentially we, we end up kind of postponing the adult stages until we can really come up with a sense of, of who am I, right? Because once I have an idea of who I am, I, have, I can have movement, right? I begin to progress towards becoming the actuality of it is of the person who I see myself as. Um, if I don't know who I am, I'm in neutral. I'm stalled, right? Um, and so, yeah, this is that opportunity to kind of shift those gears. 25. Um, this is just an image of the, let's see. You can also find this on page 404. 
um, with identity achievement. It's a list of Erickson's different stages. Um, so obviously trust versus mistrust with that very first year of life, right? Where we get a sense of hope, hopefully, if we go, everything goes well. Um, autonomy versus shame and doubt in that second stage when we're, we're toddlers, basically, where we hopefully develop a sense of will um, in, a, in a good, healthy way. Initiative versus guilt in early childhood, where we develop the sense of purpose uh, versus inhibitions. Um, industry versus inferiority in middle childhood, where we develop a sense of competence, the things that we are good at, and that hopefully we have a, a sense of, of worth connected to that. Um, adolescence, moving into emerging adulthood, we have this identity versus role diffusion, right? Where we try to find this a, a consistent sense of who we are, what we like, how we perceive the world, um, both you know politically, religiously, sexually, all these kinds of things, all uh, you know career-wise, all these things. We have a consistent basis and understanding of who we are and how we will generally react to the world. Um, now, Erickson would have said that in early adulthood, not emerging adulthood, but early adulthood, which he felt like started at age 18 and typically went till around 30, give or take. The 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 struggle is basically intimacy versus isolation. This is where we find ourselves in adolescence, and then we begin to look for someone or something. He generally said it, it's generally going to be a someone that we can give ourselves to, that we can love and be loved by. Okay. Um, if we struggle with this, uh, we can we can end up becoming anxious about close relationships. We can have jealousy issues. We can experience deep loneliness. And this is essentially a, a when you fail in finding intimacy. Now, intimacy, like I said, can be a person. So it could be a you know a life partner and things like that, um, your wife or your husband and things like that. Um, it can also be a, a to some extent like a, a calling, right? Somebody who chooses to become like a monk or a hermit or a nun or a priest or things, or maybe they're giving up that um, that intimate relationship with an individual, but they're they're finding or even to some extent, even guys who choose like to go into like Peace Corps or things like that for a life career. You're, you're, you're sacrificing your, your, the individual intimacy for a greater purpose. And that can fulfill that sense of intimacy, right? We find a sense of purpose and a sense of connection and, uh, through that, essentially. A place to love and be loved in, essentially. Um, generativity and stagnation and integrity versus despair are going to be later adulthood. So generativity is going to be what occurs generally around midlife, give or take. Um, and then integrity is going to hopefully be something that shows up in later life. So anyway, but yeah, again, again you can see that on page 404. Um, and a little star next to it. Makes, you know, Get Erickson stuck in your head pretty good. Um, he's an important one. Okay. 26, becoming your own person, part two. Uh, identity achievement. All four identity statuses are evident in emerging adulthood as the identity crisis continues. So achievement, foreclosure, moratorium, and diffusion that we, talk, like, that we looked at back in adolescence, still all there. And, and some people are going to have already achieved it. Some people are going to be in the process of trying to achieve it. Some people are going to be, you know, they've just adopted what their, what their culture, what their family has told them to do. Some people just don't seem to care at all still. You know, they're still living in their mom's basement, working at McDonald's. Um, all of these things are going to be are going to be there. Um, so in developed nations, it is normative for emerging adults to question who they really are in four areas. And it's going to be the same four areas that we have in adolescence. Sex, vocation, politics, and religion. We re-examine these things. And we're really at a better state in life, typically, a better stage in life to really dig into these four areas um, in this early adulthood stage. 27, changing status in careers. So many young adults change their identity status in the years after age 25, right? Almost all change status by age 29, meaning it could be marital status, it could be jobs. Generally speaking, you're, the average, um, we change our jobs pretty often in this stage nowadays, right? Gone are the days of at 18, you get a job at a factory and you stay there until you either retire or die. Um, Today, you might, you know, you, you I, I, even myself, okay, I was a ranch hand, I was an outdoor guide, I was a, a custodian, I was a tutor, I was a music teacher for a little while, that was a terrible idea, but um, seemed like a good idea, I'm good at music, but it, I don't like teaching that, um, 
I mean, yeah, right. Lots of different things going through there. Um, even even since then, I, I've been in academics for over 10 years now. Um, but I was an advisor. I worked as a trio coach in trio student support services. I've, I've been an instructor off and on, and I'm an instructor now. I love it. Um, and I've kind of figured out where my two, my I, these are really parts of my identity now, right? Um, teaching and farming are two things that I love doing, and I really truly are part of who I am. But I really didn't realize that until my, my late 20s. That's when I really started to dig into it. Um, I even, I even spent the time living at a monastery, trying to exploring that kind of a thing. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I spent it was four months living in a monastery, met some amazing people. I met a monk who, uh, had, the, I think he had seven PhDs. Amazing. Right. Man, I was unbelievably intelligent. I got to hold books that were over 2000 years old. Like those were experiences I would not have had if I wouldn't have taken that time to do that. But um, that's all stuff that's going to be happening again in this emerging adulthood for the most part. Okay. Um, find yourself. The, the sooner you can find yourself and kind of have a real sense of who you are, the, probably the better. Um, don't go by my personal experience necessarily on that one. So um, identity becomes deeper, more reflective, and meaningful in this period than it did before. Uh, we really we begin to understand kind of who we are. Uh, determination to have it all is part of identity achievement among many young adults. And that's going to be the challenge, right? We want to do everything. We have all of these doors available to us, right? Like all these possible paths. And because of that, you can actually almost end up with paralysis of choice. Because if I choose one path, I have to close the doors of others, right? If I get married, I'm, I've just closed the doors to every other person on the planet, like as far as choosing them to be the person I'm going to be with for the rest of my life which can be intimidating. If I, uh, you know, once I get a job, like a really good job, I've to some extent closed my other options of things that I could be doing, right? Um, I've kind of, and if you do it for an extended period of time, you kind of pigeonhole yourself. You're, 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 you're stuck in that area because that's the area that you are an expert in, unless you want to start back at the beginning as a, as a, as a very beginner, right? Um, all of those things are going to be will will make making these choices a little bit more challenging. It's worth making them though, I can tell you that. Um, so for example, like we got these two pictures here, right? We have a, a barista in, or in, barista, barista, anyway, a male person doing coffee in Germany. And we have a bunch of young uh, adults who are app developers in India. There's a good chance that, that was not, that's not their life goal, right? They're not like, I'm gonna be an app developer for the rest of my life, or I'm gonna pour coffee for the rest of my life. Might be, but it probably isn't. Um, and it's probably not what they were picturing themselves when they were like in adolescence going like, what do you want to do when you grow up, right? Um, but it's a, it's a holder. It's something that gets them through this time until they can move on to the next thing. And that's the, that's the key there is we do that now. We have these things that we hold on to things that basically allow us to get to the next thing before we, we move in, before we, we you know, make those steps. Okay, I just realized I have not been giving the facts. Um, fact number two. Cold showers have been found to have uh, more health benefits than hot or warm ones. Uh, these include improving circulation, stimulating weight loss, and easing the, the symptoms of depression. So cold showers. You can... Uh, I always done, I've, I've done a thing for years called... It's, it's known as like a Scottish shower. Um... You take a warm or hot shower uh, for the first chunk of it, and then you take a super cold shower for like the last minute. That last minute is brutal, but it, it, it incre increases your your circulation and all these things. It also improves your immune system. The cold showers that they, they found to uh, be beneficial to immune systems. So there you go. Random fact two, cold showers. Uh, 28, careers, vocational identity. So establishing vocational identity is part of growing up, right? What is it that I do? And it really is a part of our identity. Um, I am a teacher. I am a farmer, right? We don't say that I, I don't, I mean, I could say I teach and or I farm, but we, we, we embrace that as part of who we are. What we do is what we do, right? I, I am a guide or I was a guide. Things have changed, but you know. Uh, emerging adulthood is a critical stage for the acquisition of resources and developing work values. Um, this is where we get to kind of learn how to be successful as adults, right? Um, 
sticking to things. And, and even when you're like, man, I just hate this, you, you stick it out and you do the job as best you can. Um, current emerging adults change average of one job yearly between ages 18 and 25. And that does seem to be the case, right? Usually you're, you, you might be like in fast food for a year and then you get into like a restaurant or something or maybe bartending and then um, you might be getting a construction job or you might, you know, like, you know, it, it, it's that it's those kind of temporary jobs that really aren't intended to be a lifelong career. Um, work values are affected by current worldwide economic recessions, um, making work a little bit more desperate, perhaps. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what things look like in the next couple of years here as, as, as we see these shifts beginning to happen. Um, anyway, we're going to leave that there. But <clears throat> it's a critical stage. In any case, this is, this is where we are developing kind of who we are going to be in our work mindset. Even if it might not be the direct work itself that we're going to do for the rest of our lives, that we're, we're picking up the values that are going to be used in our in our working uh, careers later in life. So education, right? All those kind of things. Skills building. Um, you're building experiences. Um, all this is going to help you with your career success eventually. And to some extent, even like in relationships and things like that. Um, 29. <clears throat> Personality and Emerging Adulthood Part 1. Continuity and change. So psychological research on personality traits of twins from age 17 to 24 finds both genetic continuity and developmental improvements. Emerging adults are open to new experiences and the trend is toward less depression and more joy along with more insight into the self. Basically, what, it, what all this is saying is that um, our personalities are gonna, for the most part, remain relatively stable, right? If you're an introvert as a child, there's a, you're going to be an introvert as an adult. If you're an extrovert, same thing, right? Um, if you're a little bit neurotic as a child, you're going to be a little bit neurotic as an adult, but you might be able to tone it down, right? If introversion as a child meant that you were like, maybe maybe it has connected to being, you, were, you had social anxiety and things like that, oftentimes you can reduce that through practice and things like that. So you, it still might be there, right? You might not like being with people all that great. Um, the pandemic stuff might have made a little mess of that also, but the uh, or increased that. But the uh, the tendency is basically to to we 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 smooth out our rough edges, right? You're a rough diamond at birth with all this potential, and then experiences and and in maturing are are us cutting and sharpening and you know, cleaning and smoothing out that diamond until you become a beautiful glistening gem. Um, and that's going to be the, the case here, right? Again, this is this is what they found is that this is the happiest point in life for most people until you get into your older adulthood years. It's a slight decline after this. Um, personality emerging adulthood part two: rising self-esteem. Um, so psychological research finds both continuity and improvement in attitudes. Uh, there's a positive trend of increasing happiness has become more evident over recent decades. Uh, young adults are more likely to make their own life decisions compared to in the past. In the past, you just kind of did what you were told, right? Your 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 parents farmed, and so therefore you farm, or your you you know this is just kind of the expected route, and so therefore that's what you do. Um, in everything, <coughs> this is the person you should marry. So that's the person you marry. Um, we are we are worldwide. We are more likely to just be making our own choices um, that don't necessarily rely as much on what our society is expecting of us. Uh, comparatively. Okay. So yeah, with that, we generally have greater happiness. Okay. Um, 31, intimacy. Erickson's six psychosocial states, intimacy versus isolation, particularly emphasizes that humans are social creatures. We know this, right? We are pack animals. We are, we are a herd animal. Um, they, and we've known this for years. Aristotle, over 2,000 years ago, called us political creatures, meaning, and not like political, like we like politics, but political in that we like the, the, the polis, the, 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 group, the people, the, the group, right? We need, we need a tribe. We need a clan. So intimacy progresses from attraction to close connection to ongoing commitment. And this is going to be the, the normal process. Marriage and parenthood as emerging adults are discovering are only two of several paths of possible intimacy. So initially Erickson was like really focused on marriage and having kids and things like that. Um, but they're finding, obviously, there's a lot of other options out there that potentially could, could match that. Um, and to some extent, you can even get your intimacy needs met from just good friends. Um, you might not get your sexual needs or desires met, but you're going to get your, your you know, that, that connection that we have. 
Um, some, in some cases, good friends can actually even be more rewarding for some people than having a romantic partner. And best case scenario, you got a, a romantic partner who's also one of your best friends. That's the best, that's the best you can do. Um, 32, emerging adults and their parents. Parents continue to be crucial influences after age 18, more so now than in the past. Might have been, you know, the past, you look at even like in America, right? 1850s, um, you're a farmer and you need to move. So you move away from where you grew up. And if you move away from where you grew up, there's a good chance you're never going to talk to your family again. Right. Your parents are going to have very little influence upon you from that point forward. Um, so maybe at eight by age 18 or 20 or even younger, a lot of times, um, you might not ever see your parents again. You might write letters to them and they might, you might get letters from them every now and then. Um, but even that is, is going to be challenging back then. Today, we have much closer connections. And with that, we have uh, much more likelihood of, of that influence. And it's important. It really has been found to be a positive thing for most people. Not everyone, but most. All members of family have linked lives, much more now than they used to, right? And the downside to excessive parental support may be helicopter parenting. So there is a there is a potential bad thing here, right? Where parents remain overly involved in their in their offspring's life, even as the as their that kiddo is no longer a kiddo and is now an adult. Um, it can it can cause some hiccups, right? Um, but if you can maintain a healthy balance, it really can be very beneficial also. Um, another tough thing in this, in this stage is, is the, the, the economic tendencies of, um, it is hard to basically make it on your own nowadays, especially as an emerging adult where your job probably isn't all that great. Um, so making enough money to pay rent and all those things has been, has, has increased significantly in these past years. Um, even cost of food and all that has increased over the past years and, and seems to be increasing even more in recent years, recent months. Um, and so with that, there is a, ten, there is a higher chance of moving back in with family or parents. Well, well, I think we'll look for that in a second if I remember right. If not, I'll try to come back to it at the very end. Um, but that can be also connected to that helicopter parenting where we, 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 you kind of, you launch and then you end up coming back. Um, and that can happen a couple times potentially. Okay, 33, national differences, living with parents. So happiness of emerging adults living with parents depends on economy and culture. And in some ways, actually, culture more than economy. Um, the economy is, is really dependent on, like, if, if, if you choose to live with your parents and your parents are happy about that, um, it could be a very good thing. It could be an extended family kind of a thing going on there, um, and it can be very positive. If you have to because you have no other choice and you really don't want to, uh, that can become a very stressful thing and, and it can cause a lot of anxiety and potentially depression um, in all parties. But the cultural outlook of it is also going to be a big factor here, right? Uh, almost all unmarried young adults in Italy and Japan are going to remain in their childhood homes until they get married. Um, that's the norm. And it really is beneficial. It really, like I said, the, you have basically the younger people who can kind of help look out for their parents. The parents can also help with like supporting them financially and things while they're still trying to kind of establish themselves. And because it's the cultural norm, there's no, there's very little stress generally connected to it. It's just expected. Um, United States, on the other hand, where you know at 18 you're, you're expected to get out and be on your own, um, that can make uh, that situation a little bit more stressful in many cases. Although there seems to be a, a cultural shift, even of being more accepting or more more expectant, even of a young adult maybe staying at home for a little longer into this emerging adulthood period. Um, fewer emerging adults live with parents in the United States and se if, if separate households are affordable. So the United States, 15% of adult children aged 25 to 35 were still living with their parents um, compared to the other countries that might be, be actually higher. So uh, let's see, 34, friendship. Friendship reaches peak of functional significance. So friendship in earlier childhood, basically some, you finding people to do things with and or share yourself emotionally with. Um, Adolescence is it, they they our friends become shaping tools to some extent. We, we we begin to take on the traits and characteristics of those that we find connection with, right? Um, it continues to some extent in early child in early in early adulthood, this emerging adulthood. This is going to be the time when most people are going to actually have more friends than any other time in life. If you're like looking at yourself, you're like, I have no friends. Make some friends. Like this is the time to do it. Um, friends are going to help with self expansion. 
uh, it, it offers opportunities for mutuality that, that, you know, again, that sharing of, of, of experiences as well as, you know, the kind of back and forth. Um, there can be some, some potential negative things such as self silencing. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, hmm. Self silencing is going to be those kinds of th times where where um, you may not express yourself because you don't think that you're going to be heard. Okay, um, so this might not be a positive thing in this case. Uh, it can be in some cases, but often it, it can also be where you're just like you feel like you 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 don't necessarily have a voice, and so you just stop giving your opinions or things like that, which can be can be tough. Um, social media usage is also going to be relatively high nowadays. Um, this can be good, bad, ugly, right? Depending on the individual and how much they're using it and how they're using it and all these things. There is a direct correlation with a possibility of causation of increased anxiety and depression with people who use social media excessively. Um, it is definitely one of those tools that needs to be used in moderation if you choose to use it at all. Uh, male versus female friendships. Women are looking for intimacy, emotional emotionality, and self-disclosure. This remains true all the way through. Men are look, are generally limited touching and self-disclosure. Okay. Um, and that's a cultural thing. Uh, especially in the West. So, I, I mentioned I had friends from India and Africa and different places, right? Um my friends from Africa, one of the things that, that, that threw me at first was that when we'd be hanging out and walking, they would grab my hand and hold my hand. Um, and they were guys. And as a uh, heterosexual, you know, rural, relatively conservative male at that time, um, it freaked me out initially. American male, right? Like, this, was like what are you doing? Um, then they, I realized that they, they hold each other's hands all the time, too. It's a cultural norm, right? The touch was important to them. And in reality, the touch is important to everyone. Humans need touch. Now, each individual is going to be different, right? One person might need a lot of touch, and one person might need a very little touch. But in any case, every human on the planet needs touch because that's one of the ways that we connect. If you look at other, other intelligent animals, elephants and great apes and things like that, dolphins even, um, they touch all the time. Octopuses don't, but octopuses are a very different thing. But anyway... Uh, they're intelligent, but they're anyway. Okay, so the touch, right? That's how we're, we're social creatures. Touch is one of the ways that we can communicate so many things. A handshake does so much. It's amazing what you can learn from a handshake. I actually have a, a class in, that I, I do that when I did. I used to teach the AAA classes, um, the introduction to college kind of classes, and that was one of the things I would do it on is, is the handshake. How important a good handshake is because how much you can learn in literally microseconds. Um, from a handshake. If you don't like, if that's something interesting, you look it up. There's some cool stuff out there um, that, that has the science behind a handshake. But we need touch, right? Um, unfortunately, it has, and it's only in the recent years, the last hundred years, a little less than hundred years, you're going to see that men stops touching. If you look at pictures from like the 19, like the early 1900s and 1800s, um, you're going to see a lot of guys holding hands, arms around each other, right? All these kinds of things. Um, Around the 1920s, 1930s, there was a shift in thinking, um, the stoic kind of thinking approached where men weren't supposed to be emotional and men weren't supposed to touch. Um, and so that was a, there was a shift that occurred then. But it's needed. It should be brought back, right? Um, Self-disclosure is also important to some extent. What we're, what, one thing that we are looking for, and it remains the same from childhood, um, women are looking for that intimacy and that emotional connection. Men are looking for people to do things with. Um, so there's a there's a one example is like women women like friends that they face, you know, face to face, have this conversation with. Men like friends that they stand by each other, doing something together, and that's pretty common worldwide. Men typically, even though there is more touch and things like that with men um, in other cultures, the the the, the tendency towards um, the tendency is towards finding someone to do something with. That seems to be a biological factor more. And that's not to say that women don't want to do things together and that men don't want emotional connection. Not at all. But it, the, that that's the strong tendency. That's why we seek friendship. All right. 35, Romantic Partners, Part 1. United States romantic competence is multifaceted. 
uh, mutual caring, trust, emotional closeness, sensitivity, and uh, to needs of others. These are all going to be aspects of um, what we would consider romance. Okay. Um, faithfulness, loyalty, and honesty are going to be three of the most important aspects of a romantic relationship. Right? It's somebody who we, we have this sense of, of trust with, um, obviously emotionally connected to them in some way. Right? Uh, it progresses generally from in, in American, American style romance. Um, it progresses from physical attraction. Do you have chemistry with the person, right? Generally, if you have chemistry with somebody, it's because you're genetically, um, it's a good match, genetically speaking. Your offspring will be strong. If, it, if you've ever kissed somebody and it feels almost like kissing a sibling, um, it's probably because you are genetically too close, in which case you're not going to have as much diversity, in which case your offspring won't be as strong, and which can kind of actually be a turnoff. Um, so, so when, when you when you kiss somebody for the first time, there's again we have tons of receptors set in our in our lips, um, chemical receptors as well as touch and all these things, and so you get um, and and your sense of smell, it's all right there. The kiss is an amazing. It tells you a lot about the person um, that you are kissing, um, but you're also telling them a lot about yourself. But anyway, all of these things, right? All these factors, um, and it can be an incredible thing, or it could be a total turnoff in that in that kiss. Um, there was a girl, I started dating this one girl, and we actually, when we kissed, um, I knew it was over at the first kiss. Because I, I basically lost all romantic attraction to her. And it turns out when I talked to her a couple times, a couple, we had, went on a couple dates after that. And I was just like, I don't know what happened, but you know, I mentioned that. And she was like, me too. And it was the weirdest thing. We were friends after that. Um, but it, yeah, it just, it killed the romance. Who would have thought that a kiss would kill the romance? Uh, on the other hand, the first time I kissed my wife, I knew she was the one. So, um, right, that's that. It goes from attraction to to emotional attachment to loyalty and and this idea of of committing to each other for the long term. Okay, so love American style is sought in some other countries. Um, Western Europe is going to do it pretty much the same as we do. Uh, it's becoming more attractive in other cultures, such as India and places like that, but, but they, they still do have the traditional like arranged marriages and things. Um, interestingly, arranged marriages and, and some of those actually can be very successful. They can have very happy uh, connections and lives. It just, it just really does, it's a change in, in the whys behind a marriage and why they're choosing to get connected to each other. Okay. Uh, slide 36. Let me see if I can find that. There's a, it's an image. Ah, there we go. Page 411. Um, same yet different. Friends you could call if in trouble late at night. Um, they found that the, the, the people who generally have the most friends in this stage of life uh, are, are going to be um, men, generally. Straight men, specifically. Um, so the, the, the different colors here are going to have, you're going to have uh, blue is persons under the age of 30, number of same sex friends, uh, persons under the age of 30, number of other sex friends uh, is going to be green. The yellow goldy color is persons over the age of 30, number of same sex friends. And then purple is persons over age 30, number of other sex friends. And what you'll notice is there's a, there's a pretty good decline um, in friendships overall. The, sadly, the group that actually has the least number of friends uh, in the long run are middle-aged men. They, they, they generally end up with very few people who they actually would really be friends with, right? They have friends, but they never do anything together. And so with that, they don't get the benefits of having friends. But this stage of under 30 years old, um, friends are, are active. They're, you're at a much higher, uh, have much higher chances of, 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 of having those connections and those emotional um, opportunities and all these kinds of things, right? Um, but overall, when you actually look at the numbers, it's pretty close, right? Straight men, straight women, gay men, lesbian women, bisexual men, bisexual women. Generally speaking, the friendships are pretty close numbers wise, um, overall, right? Um, and then same after 30, we, we, we end up with lower amounts of friends after 30 overall. So, <clears throat> um, be aware of this. Friendships take time. Friendships take work. Um, you got to cultivate them. If you don't, if you're not willing to put in the time and the work, uh, the friendship will fade, right? 
you might still be technically friends with them. You might be friends with them on Facebook or something like that. But if you're not doing things together on a regular basis, making that time to spend together, um, the friendship will begin to fade. So make friends and take that, make that effort. It's worth it. Even if it's just one or two, it's worth it. Um, 37, Romantic Partners Part 2. By the way, having more than one friend is, in, well, we'll see this when we look at adult, a later adulthood. Having more than one friend can be a very beneficial thing because if something happens to that one friend and that's the only friend you've got, you've just lost your entire social community. So um, diversify somewhat. <laughs> okay, 37, Romantic Partners Part 2. Most emerging adults are postponing, not abandoning marriage. Um, eventually they get married, especially in the United States. In the United States, actually, we have a, a relatively high number of people that eventually get married compared to the other parts of the world in, in more advanced nations like Western Europe and Northern Europe things. Um, hooking up and friends with benefits are becoming more common. So just because we're not married doesn't mean that we don't have sexual needs or desires. And so therefore, we, the, the tendency in our culture, like the Netflix and chill kind of thing, right? Um, we're, we're, we're wanting our sexual gratification without actually having the commitment. Okay, We want our cake and we want to eat it too kind of a thing. Which is a weird saying. But anyway, I want to have the cake, but I also want to eat it, but I still want to have it, right? And that's basically what we got here. We want our freedom. We want our individuality. But we also still want the benefits that come with a, with a romantic relationship. So um, in, in, in many individuals and, and couples' ideas, marriage is still considered very crucial. Um, and honestly, developmentally speaking, marriage has been found to be to improve overall ha happiness and, and satisfaction with life. Um, it does have a, a big impact. So what they, they, they did find is like happiness wise, married couples generally are happier than unmarried couples. Um, or, or unmarried individuals, but later in life, if one of the if, if somebody becomes a widow or a widower, um, that loss you, you you end up becoming less happy than people who never had anybody throughout that whole process because of that loss you, you you've entangled your life with someone else so deeply that by when you lose them you essentially lose a piece of yourself. We'll look at that later in in the following chapters. Okay. Um, 38, finding a partner. But before that, we're going to go with a real quick random fact. So random fact number three, originally bumper cars were not supposed to hit each other despite the chaotic way that they are drive around. That's actually kind of the point. You're supposed to try to try to get around the loop without hitting anybody. Um, the first patent was in 1920 and it was named the, it was by the company Dodgem. Um, it's, that was the, the thinking. And then eventually people just like intentionally started crashing each other because that was more fun. And then that became the thing. So I went from dodgems to, to bumper cars. Okay. 38, finding a partner, social networks, and dating sites. So result in about one-third of all U.S. marriages today. Um, <laughs> interesting things. Choice overload is going to be a thing, right? This is kind of like the theme of, of the world today. Um, it's what makes adolescence difficult. It's what makes early adulthood difficult. It basically is what makes life, it makes life difficult. We have so many choices. Right, you go to the store and you look for ketchup. There's a there's actually a really funny uh, Simpsons clip about that where, where Mr. Burns is is shopping for the first time and he's like ketchup, catsup, ketchup, catsup. He like freaks out and like starts chucking stuff. But anyway, um, like you know, you go to the peanut butter aisle. And there's like 30 brands of you know. Do you want smooth? Do you want extra smooth? Do you want uh, crunchy or super crunchy or you know, extremely crunchy and like all these things, you have all these options, right? It's overwhelming. Same thing with potential mates. You have a choice overload, especially when you're looking at, if you look at an online dating site, right? There's so many options, makes a thoughtful choice quite difficult. It also increases the likelihood of buyer's regret, if you will. Regret after making a choice is more likely because of all the choices. So if your choice is you want the black one or the, or the like I'm looking at cars, sorry, not people. I just sounded really racist there for a second. Do you want a black car or do you want a red car? They're exactly the same car. The only difference is the color. Okay. You, you're more than likely going to be very satisfied with the car because those are your only two choices that were available to you. If on the other hand, you go to a lot and you're like, do you want a truck? Do you want a Jeep? Do you want a, a car? Do you want a sports car? Are you looking for a four door or two door? Uh, do you want like, you know, this and that and this and all these different options and do you want like six cup holders or just four or do you want 10 cup holders, right? All these different options make us much more likely to regret our choice because it's like, ah oh, man, that one might have been better. 
when it looks like we have a lot of choices available to us in, in loved ones or potential mates, it actually increases the likelihood that you're going to be like, oh, I wonder if that if, if she would have been or he would have been better than the one I chose. Okay. Um, so yeah, choice can be good. Too much choice, not so much. And today we have a lot of choice oftentimes. Okay. You look at, you know, again, 100 years ago, you, you're, there's a good chance you're not going to go very far from where you grew up. So you might have like maybe seven people that are roughly in your age group that are like available. Um, so those are your choices, right? That would be much easier. And you could be like, well, I, I know I like this one much better than the other one. So that's going to be my first choice, right? Um, which reduces the likelihood of that regret. All right, 39, identity, identity and intimacy cohabitation. So living with an unrelated person, typically a romantic partner to whom one is not married. That is officially what cohabiting is. Doesn't necessarily mean that you are romantically connected. You could just be roommates technically, but generally when we use this term, it's connected to romance. Uh, most you know, young adults in the United States, England and Northern Europe cohabit rather than marry before the age of 25. Other nations such as Japan, Ireland, and Italy, uh, significantly fewer people choose to go have it um, beforehand. What's interesting is, uh, here actually, we're, we're going to go ahead and flip to the next slide, slide 40. Uh, more together, fewer married. There's a, there's, a, there's a swing towards people choosing to, to live together and not to get married. Um, 1970, only about in the United States specifically. Uh, and this is specifically male-female couples. This is They, have, they did not look at, at uh, same-sex um, couples. So male, female, romantically living together, unmarried partners. Um, about half a million couples were households were choosing to do this in 1970. As of 2015, 7.5, give or take, million um, couples are cohabiting rather than getting married. Um, and again, they didn't they didn't tally same sex uh, couples in this at all. It was it was all just male, female uh, partners. Um, so it's probably actually significantly higher than what you see here. Um, these also aren't counted like if, let's say like one of, one of the, you're, you're, you're living at one of your parents' houses. That also wouldn't be counted. You, you're specifically living alone together. Um, it's an interesting thing. So cohabiting is, is, is a, well here, actually, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So there's been a, a drastic increase in cohabiting. Um, 41, developmental consequences of cohabitation. So cohabitation before marriage does not prevent marital problems, including churning. Churning is where you break up and then get together and then break up and then get together and then break up and then get together with the same person over and over and over again. That's going to be churning. Um, what they found actually, interestingly enough, in the last, uh, and you got to remember that most of this research is done from 10 years ago. Um, there is research, there, there are continuous research, and it still seems to be holding true, but it, it, it's, it's there, yeah, anyway, take that in mind. If so, um, results of meta-analysis reveal that cohabitation is linked to higher likelihood of divorce. Um, so choosing to live together beforehand and then, uh, and then getting married actually increases the likelihood of divorce statistically. There's different thinking of why this could be. Um, Part of it is actually the next the next little paragraph or piece there. Less likely to pool money, have close parental relationships, or care for parental health needs. Um, they're more likely to be criminals or break up. So the you know again ten years ago, um, but cohabiting oftentimes it can it can be somewhat connected to this individuality, right? Your your you you get used to basically being two separate units in the same house. Where traditionally marriage is the unity of two people into one identity to some extent, right? Um, and so this this shift might be part of it, like because of the fact that you're less likely to like again kind of put all your money into the same account and things like that. When you, when when they found that statistically, uh, people who choose to cohabit habitate before they get married, they're more likely to have their own separate bank accounts. Um, it's kind of like one of those you pay this bill, I'll pay this one kind of a thing, rather than just drawing from the same funds. Um, so it actually ends up becoming less of a team effort. Uh, and again, more just kind of like almost like roommates that happen to have romantic benefits. Um, 
which makes you less loyal to some extent, potentially. Not guaranteed. You could be, you could cohabit for years and then get married and then and never have any problems ever. Um, and you might pool your money and all these kinds of things, but it is more likely. Okay. So most research is based on people who cohabited about 10 to 20 years ago again. So there, you got to kind of take this with a grain of salt, but it's there still. 42, you're going to find this image on page 415. Uh, love you, love you not. This is going to be physical conflict, verbal abuse, and physical and verbal conflict. Um, blue represents people who are consistently together. Red is people who are consistently broken up. This, generally, the conflict is what actually caused the breakup. Um, green is unstable or churning. You know, you, you, you break up and you're back together. You break up and you're back together. And you break up and you're back together. What they found is that people who are in, in relationships that are churning oftentimes have significantly more conflict than, than those that were consistently together and or broken up. Um, so yeah, this is a this was kind of a big one. Um, but anyway, that, take a look at that in, in the book. Gives you a little more details on that. 43, the broader picture. Every human of every cohort and culture benefits from a satisfying and enduring relationship. Whether that be friends, whether that be romantic, whatever. We need people in our lives, so make sure that you have somebody to have an emotional connection with. And possibly physical, but anyway. Last random fact. Zebras have only one toe on each foot. <laughs> there you go. Zebras, these little one-toed creatures. Um, four toes, I guess, total. total. So, um, yes, there's that. Don't forget to do the, the, the quiz relating to those four random facts that you just get the last one from. Um, yeah, until then, we'll, in the next chapter, we'll be looking at adulthood. So basically 25 until around 65, give or take. Um, everything that's happening in there is a lot. You know, we potentially are having kids and, and, and careers are settling in and all this stuff. So, so if you want to read ahead, go ahead. But until that video comes up, have a wonderful day and or night and or morning and whatever time it happens to be that you're watching this video wonderful week if it happens to be a while before you watch the next one. Um, I will see you in the next video looking at chapter 12, Adult Body and Mind. All right. Bye.